Hello everyone, welcome to our third lecture for AP Human Geography, Unit Number 7, Cities and Urban Land Use. Tonight, our primary focus is going to be talking about the central place theory. But before we get started with that, we have a couple other items to address that are going to directly influence our understanding of Walter Kristaller's central place theory. So let's get started by talking about market areas. A market area, it's one of our vocab terms, is the area surrounding a central place from which people are attracted to use the place's goods and services. It is also known as the hinterland. So make sure that you, you know that that is an alternative name. Uh, sometimes they're used interchangeably. Uh, so just be aware that that is something that you may see. Uh, market areas are directly based on two major items, both of which are vocabulary terms, range and threshold. So first off, the range is going to be the maximum distance that people are willing to travel in order to use a particular service. So the operative part of that definition is going to be the maximum distance. So how far is the farthest someone is willing to travel? And then the threshold is going to be the minimum number of people needed to support a service. So typically services are going to be profit driven. So what is the minimum number of people that you need in order to break through, uh, pay off all your costs and earn a profit? Uh, market areas, if we were to draw them, what would be the ideal shape for a market area in your head? You've got uh, the center point there, and how how would you draw this? How would it how would what would be the ideal shape? Keep it in mind that market areas are a good example of a functional or nodal region focused around a, a center point. So that center point is whatever the the service is, and the the boundary then is going to be. Uh, our range. So that then becomes the market area. So let's take a look at what this optimal market area would look like. So if you were a business owner, and this is something that students in the past have told me uh, was really helpful for them. They've, they've had as a, a goal that they want to own their own business. Uh, so this is something that as a business owner, you would absolutely need to consider. So the first thing that we want to talk about is the range. How far are people willing to drive for your service? So the example that you can see there is, uh, let's say that people are willing to drive 10 miles for a pizza. Um, now this brings up a whole bunch of other questions, you know, like uh, situational characteristics. Uh, are people willing to drive further because it's uh, on a particular side of the street? I know that may sound ridiculous, but if something's on the right-hand side of the street from the direction that you're coming, that might be a little bit more convenient than if they have to stop and wait to make a left-hand turn across traffic. Uh, in addition to that, you have to take into account how people are, are getting around. Uh, you know, I said 10 miles, willing to drive 10 miles for a pizza. What happens if most of the people in your area aren't driving? What happens if they are walking, if they are taking a bus, if they're riding a bicycle, um, subway, whatever the, the case may be. Uh, these are all characteristics that as you as the business owner would have to take into consideration when deciding what the optimal location for your business would be. From there, then you have to start figuring out, okay, what is my, my break even point and at what point do I start to make a profit? That's your threshold. So for example, if you know that you need to make $5,000 a week and that the average person spends about $5 a week on pizza, well, that would mean then that you need 1,000 people to come into your store in order to make a profit. From there, then you can draw that optimal location. So we know where your particular site is. You're going to draw that range of 10 miles. That then becomes your market area. And then you can look at you know, census data, you can look at, and you could use a variety of geospatial technologies. You could look at, you know, GIS, um, just actual raw census data in order to determine, are there a thousand people living within that 10 mile market area? 
If the answer is yes, then that location should work for your business. And if the answer is no, then you may want to be looking for another spot to try and find that ideal location. So let's go ahead and apply this. Uh, it has always been my dream to own a scented candle shop. That is, since I was a young man, I've always dreamed of owning a scented candle shop. And uh, to be clear, this isn't going to be a boring scented candle shop. We're going to have a wide variety of awesome scented candles. We're going to have pizza scented candles, uh, fresh cut grass. Uh, so, I mean, we're going to have a lot of different scents. And so uh, I'm thinking that this will be Mr. Pileski's sensational candle shop. Get it? Sensational. <laughs> um, so in this case, I'd have to take a look at, okay, well, how far are people willing to drive for one of my scented candles? Well, because my scented candles are so amazing and I have so many different scents, uh, they're going to be willing to drive hundreds of miles for an opportunity to shop in my scented candle shop. And because scented candles probably don't cost a whole lot and I don't have to, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily need a huge number of people. I should be just fine in just about any location. But uh, before I quit my teaching job to open my scented candle shop, I should probably do a little bit more research on this. So what I'd like you to do is is kind of think about this uh, from your perspective. What's something passionate about it? Uh, if you were to open a business, what would you want it to be? Think about, okay, how far would people be willing to, to travel for that? How much competition would you be, uh, have? Uh, I know that I have other candle shops that I would compete with, you know, the bath and body works of the world, uh, but they sell all the generic flavors. And so uh, people are going are gonna to be willing to travel much further uh, for my scented candles. But think about how this applies to you. How far are people willing to drive for that? How much competition do you have? How many people do you think you would need in order to break even? And obviously, you'd probably have to do a little bit more research to figure out, okay, you know, what are my costs? What am I paying my workers? How many workers do I have? What's my rent? All these different types of things are going to come into consideration. Um, and this is when we can incorporate other elements of, of the class. We've talked about Weber's least cost theory. We've talked about locational theory. This is just one more element of that. So I'd like you to bring that example to class, and we're going to talk about that a little bit uh, and, and look into to how far we would have to go with this. So the last thing that we have to talk about before we get into central place theory is the gravity model. Now we've already discussed the gravity model once this year uh, in migration, our migration unit, because we used it to perhaps kind of predict uh, migration patterns. And we said that uh, larger places would likely have uh, either more migrants leaving or more migrants coming. And that actually fits with Ravenstein's laws of migration. Because Ravenstein said that if someone were making a big move, they're more likely to end up in a big city. And so this fits with that. But in this case, we're going to use the gravity model because it's really useful in explaining how different cities interact with one another. So here's our definition as we will use it in this particular unit. A model which holds that the potential use of a service at a particular location is directly related to the number of people in a location and inversely related to the distance people must travel to reach that service. So a couple really important parts that we're going to elaborate on just below here. Uh, we said that it is directly related to the number of people. A positive relationship, what we call a positive correlation, means that as one side goes up or one element goes up, so too does a, another element. So in this case, as we get more people, there should be more interaction. In addition to that, we said that it is inversely related to distance. Uh, an inverse relationship or a negative correlation means that as one goes up, the other goes down. So in this case, as distance goes up, interaction goes down. Uh, and this is a perfect example of distance decay. 
And so we can actually calculate this using a formula that is very similar to Newton's law of gravity. And so we can look at the population of one place times the population of a second place divided by the distance between them squared, and that will give us an interaction coefficient. And the higher that interaction coefficient, the more interaction, in theory, there should be. So let's pose a, a real-world example. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to give you three locations, and I want you to try and predict using what you know of the populations of these areas and where they are relative to one another, uh, how much interaction there would be. So we're going to use Henderson, Nevada, our home, uh, and try and predict the amount of interaction between Henderson and, here are our three locations, Las Vegas, Nevada, Los Angeles, California, and New York City, New York. So which one of those three areas would have the greatest amount of interaction with Henderson, Nevada? Again, we have to use what we know of the populations of those places and uh, the distance of those areas. And despite the fact that Las Vegas has the lowest population by far of those three different areas, it's going to have the most interaction because the distance is the smallest. So despite the fact that Los Angeles and New York uh, have much greater populations, um, Las Vegas is going to have the most interaction. Now, the last thing that we need to mention with regards to gravity model and how it relates to market location that we've been talking about and what we're going to talk about next, central place theory, is that uh, when you diminish the distance, in other words, diminishing the range that people have to travel, it means that there's going to be more interaction, which thus means that we're more likely to hit the threshold that we need, the minimum number of people that we need in order to support our business. So you don't necessarily have to have a huge population if your range is, is conducive to what, what you're trying to do. Um, obviously, as the distance grows, fewer people are going to make that, that trip. And so that's going to be very important when we start talking about central place theory. So here we go. All right, so here we go with central place theory. This was created by Walter Christaller, and that is a name you are absolutely going to want to know. So put a big old star next to Walter Christaller's name, because he was the one that came up with this theory. So we can actually use what we've learned about gravity model, range, threshold, all those different types of things to understand what central place theory is. So here is our definition that we will work with in this class. A theory proposed by Walter Christaller that explains the distribution of services based on the fact that settlements serve as centers of market areas for services. Larger settlements are fewer and farther apart than smaller settlements and provide services for a bigger number of people who are willing to travel farther. So let's make some connections to some other vocabulary terms. For a larger number of people, what vocabulary term do we, should we associate with that? And uh, you are willing, who are willing to travel farther? What vocabulary term should we associate with that? Well, right there, that's our range and our threshold. And that's important. Uh, so it determines where places are in the urban hierarchy. So notice there that we have uh, our different elements, hamlets, village, towns, cities. Uh, and we have a central place surrounded by a market area. So let's ask, a little bit of review here, what type of, of region would this represent? Now, recall, what would be our ideal shape for this type of region? We have a center point and an area surrounding it. What would be the ideal shape? We asked that question earlier in this lecture. Now let's kind of apply this uh, to, to bring it home to, to give it uh, some teeth. Um, let's talk about airports. Las Vegas, Nevada has uh, McCarran International Airport. It is, it's right there in the title, an international airport. So the service that is provided uh, is somewhat unique. Being able to fly 
to other countries. That's not something that a lot of other airports can do. You know, you go out to Boulder City, they have an airport, but uh, not very likely to be flying to other countries. So um, it's a Las Vegas is a larger settlement. Uh, we have a particular service that serves uh, a larger number of people. Now, one of the other settlements that we talked about with rank size rule here in Clark County, Nevada, is Cal Navari. It's a pretty small settlement. They do also have an airport. Um, but the Cal Navari airport, if you've ever driven by it, uh, which my wife and I have, uh, we were driving through Cal Navari and we're like, hey, look, there's the airport. And there it goes. So it's it's a very tiny airport. Uh, it's It's a dirt runway. People fly in, they fly out. Most of the people that use it own their own planes. You know, people will fly in for breakfast at a local diner and then fly out. So um, we're not talking about international travel. We're not talking about lots of people needed to sustain it. So there's a difference in terms of the uh, amount of people uh, that, that are needed to sustain it. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not trying to diss on uh Cal Navari, I'm not trying to insult anyone there, um, but using gravity model to predict the likelihood of someone being upset by these statements, um, the population isn't very high, so the likelihood of someone seeing this video from Cal Navari uh, maybe isn't very high either. But if you do, I'm not trying to insult you, just trying to use this as a, a real world example. So let's take a look at what central place theory uh, the model itself looks like. So once again, this is central place theory. So you can see the urban hierarchy used uh, in our key down there at the bottom. You've got the star represents the city. You've got the triangle is our town, square, village, uh, and then the small circle is going to be all of our different hamlets. So what shapes do you see aside from the star, triangle, etc.? What other shapes do you see? What shape is utilized throughout central place theory? And hopefully what you see is that it is a series of hexagons. From small to large, we've got a lot of different hexagons going on here. Now, back to the previous question we've asked, asked a few times, what would be the ideal shape of a functional region? We said the perfect functional region would probably be a circle with a center point, that, that node at the center of our functional region. But that's not what we see here with central place theory. We see hexagons. So why do you think Walter Christaller used hexagons for this model? And we'll explain it here in a couple minutes, but I wanna see if maybe you can think. What, what's the problem with circles? That's the ideal functional region, right? So why not circles? Why hexagons? Why not something else? Why not squares? Why not something else? So I wanted you to kind of think about that a little bit and see if we can come up with a reason why. And you can see it visually here. And see if we can piece together the answers. So let's look at another perspective of this. Once again, we can see our urban hierarchy, city, town, village, hamlet, uh, this time color co coordinated instead of shapes. Um, Notice here, we've got two different keys. We've got the keys at the bottom representing the actual urban settlements, and then we have the key at the top representing the boundaries. That's gonna be the range. And so the market areas are larger surrounding larger settlements. Inside of that, we see larger numbers of people within a larger market area. So therefore, the threshold is going to have to be higher. So in cities, what we tend to see are higher range and higher threshold services. So what I'd like to ask you right now is to kind of brainstorm. What kind of services do you, would you consider high range, high threshold services? What would be a service that people would be willing to travel long distances for and would require a fairly large number of people in order to, to break that barrier and be profitable? So try and think about that. And on the flip side of that, what services aren't going to need that? What services might we see 
in the smallest of hamlets on a fairly consistent basis. Uh, what isn't going to need a lot of people and what are people not willing to drive or travel very far for? So these are, are really important questions. So back to that question about why hexagons. Uh, we asked earlier what the ideal functional region would look like, and we said ideally it would be a perfect circle with that node, that focal point, right at the center. Now this presents some issues when it comes to Walter Kristaller's theory about services uh, and range and threshold. So as you can see there, when we have multiple circles, uh, we have gaps in areas that overlap. In those gaps, essentially what we would be saying as far as Kristaller's theory would be is that you would never have access to that service. So if you lived in a gap and you needed to fly internationally, you absolutely couldn't. Now, we, we know that that's just not realistic. Obviously, you're going to be able to. You just might have to travel further. Uh, but you, you would have that ability. Now, the areas that overlap present a different problem because... It's that issue of threshold, of profitability. Because if you have, let's say again, two international airports in very close proximity that fly to the exact same places, well, then you might not have the available threshold. So it's kind of interesting to look at airports as we're, we continue to use this example and look at especially international airports in close proximity to one another. Uh, what airlines fly in and out of there or what airlines do use that uh, area as a hub or a more uh, common place that they fly in and out of uh, what countries do they fly to if they are in fact international airports because uh, it's kind of an interesting example especially when you see two international airports in relatively close proximity to one another so that's the issue with circles is that there's gaps and then in order to uh, eliminate the gaps, you have to overlap, and that obviously presents an issue as far as threshold is concerned. Uh, squares, the distance varies quite a bit from the center, and so hexagons are kind of a compromise of the two. They do nest together. That's what we call it when they, they touch without having any gaps or overlap. They nest together, um, and the distance from the center point doesn't vary as much as they would in, say, a square. Now, obviously, um, it does vary a little bit, but it kind of makes sense because the further you live away from the city, you know, you, you're going to have to obviously travel a little bit further. Uh, and then you might have the question about, do you go to another city? And But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. We're going to answer that question here shortly. Now, as with any model that we have talked about this year, there are some assumptions that have to be made in order for this model to actually work in reality. So Walter Kristaller said that certain things have to be assumed to be true in order for the hexagons to manifest themselves in reality. So we have to have a flat uh, terrain with no physical barriers, no mountains, hills, things like that. Soil fertility would have to be the same throughout. Population would have to be uh, consistent purchasing power and tastes and demands so you know what people desire would have to be the same uh, or uniform throughout uh, we'd have to have uniform transportation networks we wouldn't have to have places that are you know uh, dramatically far or, or inconvenient to get to um, and we have to assume that a good or service could be sold in all directions from a given point um, out to a certain distance now uh, as is often the case, let's ask the question, are these realistic assumptions? And the answer is, of course not. Um, but now I want to see if you can make some connections to some other units. Um, what other models had similar assumptions? Keep in mind that central place theory is a location theory. And so what other location theories had similar assumptions. And that's an important point to recognize is that anytime we're talking about location theory, there are going to be certain things that we have to assume to be true uh, in order for these models to work. Now, Kristaller knew that these assumptions were not realistic as some of our other individuals did, Weber, Fontuna, and so on. Um, hexagons don't actually manifest themselves in reality, but once again, 
Um, they had to nest together. We can't have that overlap. Um, so instead, we have to look at, at certain elements like population size, distance, things like that. Now, what's kind of an interesting point is to ask the question uh, or to think about maybe the East Coast. Uh, on the East Coast of the United States, we have a lot of big cities uh, with more people. Obviously, when we talk about bigger settlements, big cities, we know that they're going to have more services. So it's kind of an interesting, almost a you know chicken or the egg type scenario. Uh, you know, did people move to the cities because they had more services? Or did the cities develop more services because they already had bigger populations? And so it's kind of an interesting scenario. And obviously, probably what, what the realistic answer is, is that it's a little bit of both, that more services came as more people came and more people started to come because more services became available. But it's kind of interesting to think about uh, in terms of why certain places have certain services. Now... A few minutes ago, I asked you guys to come up with uh, an example of some high-range, high-threshold services. And so we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. All right, so before we look at any specific services, let's instead look at spheres of influence. So this map was generated by asking people, what central city has the biggest impact on your day-to-day -day life? So there's a couple of really interesting points here. Uh, first off, let's take a look at uh, the big city that apparently impacts our day-to-day -day life, and that is Las Vegas. And that's the kind of pink class uh, surrounding the red dot that represents Las Vegas. So we can see that the sphere of influence uh, for Las Vegas extends beyond the boundaries of just the state of Nevada. So market areas in this case don't necessarily coincide with political boundaries. But then we have to ask the question, why? What is causing this sphere of influence to be the way that it is? Because if we look right next door in Salt Lake City uh, or at Salt Lake City, its sphere of influence is significantly greater. We look in Colorado, Denver extends uh, to states that aren't even contiguous to it. You know, you go up into Montana and they're the city that influences them, at least in the southern, very small part of Montana, is still Denver, two states away. And so it's an in interesting question to ask, why do cities have the influence that they do? Because the market area, in this case, the sphere of influence for cities vary uh, based on a number of different factors, whether it is population, whether it is the services that it provides, and, you know, this relative concept as well. Because let's look at Arizona for a moment. The northernmost red dot is the city of Flagstaff. And Flagstaff, the sphere of influence for Flagstaff is represented by the color purple. Now, if you take a look, there's no purple immediately surrounding Flagstaff meaning that the central city that impacts Flagstaff isn't even Flagstaff, it's Phoenix. So then why is Flagstaff represented on here? Well, if we look in the northeast corner of Arizona, we see that there's a very small area where Flagstaff is the central city that impacts their day-to-day -day life the most. So this brings up the concept of urban hierarchy. You know, how would we classify other cities in the northeastern part of Arizona? How would we classify Flagstaff? How would we classify Phoenix? Because they have different urban, class, uh, urban hierarchy classifications. So it's kind of interesting to look at that. And then the market area is also influenced by this because take a look at Colorado and look at Colorado Springs. The northernmost part of the market area or sphere of influence for Colorado Springs is very, very close to Colorado Springs, but its market area extends much further to the south. And so its relationship, its situation to other big cities directly influences its, in this case, sphere of influence. But now let's look at some very specific services. 
So let's take a look at a very specific service that has a high range. You need, uh, people are willing to travel very far for this service. Uh, a high threshold. You need a lot of people in order to make profit. And that is professional sports. So in this case, we are looking at a map that asked fans to identify their favorite uh, NFL football team. The areas that are gray have insufficient votes. So what does that perhaps tell you about the population of those areas um, or also, you know, conflicting uh, fan bases? Now, this is kind of an interesting uh, exercise because we could talk about as a relatively current event, the relocation of the St. Louis Rams to Los Angeles. Now, St. Louis's fan base, or the, the area that identifies as St. Louis Rams fans, obviously around St. Louis. But if you take a look at the market area surrounding the central city of St. Louis, uh, it isn't quite as big as some of our other franchises. So could that have influenced the decision by the team to relocate to Los Angeles, which we know is the second largest settlement in the United States. Now, this is a, a similar map, um, but in this case, instead of being almost kind of a dot distribution map, which is what we were looking at on the last slide, uh, in this case, we can kind of see uh, very large areas that might be very sparsely populated. Um, now, the cartographer for this particular map uh, the article was actually called Why the Denver Broncos Are America's Team. Uh, and when you look at it, you can see why they made that claim. And if you go back to the previous slide, uh, there's a little bit of conflict of data. So it's kind of an interesting uh, point. But when you look at the area that is encompassed by the Denver Broncos there, um, not a lot of other franchises very small, sparsely settled areas. Um, once again, to continue the, the point we were just asking, look again at St. Louis right in the interior of the map and look at Los Angeles. We've got com conflicting fan bases in the southern part of, of California. How might this map look different if we were to redraw it to represent the Los Angeles Rams? Now, once again, we can apply this to other sports and in other sports and other professional sports. Um, we have different teams. For example, there is no Utah-based NFL franchise, but there is a Utah-based NBA franchise, the Utah Jazz. And so to see how the maps shift and change with regards to different franchises or, or different professional sports, and the question I'd like to ask on, on each of these different slides is, um, if you were to expand these professional sports leagues, where would you open up? Where would you grant a large enough population to breach the threshold and uh, maybe not as much competition with regards to range? So more people are willing to travel a longer distance in order to come to your specific sporting event. To continue that, that topic, uh, we could ask, are there certain sports where the threshold is different? You know, do you need fewer people to make a profit or fewer fans to make a profit um, depending on the professional sport that we're talking about, whether we're talking about, in this case, NHL or soccer versus football, you know, what are your, your costs? What are your expenses versus how much are you charging for tickets? There's a lot that goes into this. But when you talk about the concept of threshold, the number of people that you need in order to make a profit, if you have a lower threshold, then you don't need as many people which then opens up more cities as potential markets. So when we talk about Las Vegas getting an NHL franchise, could we reasonably predict that perhaps NHL franchises don't need 
or don't have as high a threshold, and therefore a smaller city like Las Vegas could be justified in having a professional sports franchise. You know, do you think we'll see an, NA, uh, an NFL franchise in Las Vegas anytime soon? Probably not, because I would imagine the threshold would be much higher for an a NFL franchise than it would be for maybe an NHL or Major League Soccer franchise. Kind of an interesting concept to, to think about, you know. Uh, finally, the last Major League sport that we'll look at is baseball. Um, and the question I want to ask once again is, uh, if you were to expand uh, Major League Baseball again, where would you put another team? And that question we will actually answer in class. We'll do an exercise with central place theory in class, um, and you'll predict where you think another Major League Baseball franchise will go. So we'll see that. We'll, we'll come up with that. But I want you to come up with a hypothesis. Just in looking at this map, the areas that have insufficient votes, um, areas that you know to have big cities, uh, areas that you think would have enough people to support a Major League Baseball franchise. Uh, and maybe also areas that have very large market areas, very small market areas. Is that going to influence your decision? Finally, last thing to talk about here is if we shifted scale, and instead of talking about professional sports, we talked about college athletics, how does this map change? Because do you need as high a threshold? Uh, is it all about profit? Uh, at least the, the purest might say in college athletics, uh, it's not about making a profit. Um, though the business side of things, we would probably say yes, it, it, there certainly is a profit to be made. But with the large number of universities that we have, how does that affect range? How does that affect threshold? How does that affect market area? How does that affect the number of teams that we see playing out here? Um, and does it also affect the program choices that a school decides to offer? For example, if we're not talking about football, instead we're talking about ice hockey programs. Instead we're talking about wrestling programs. Instead we're talking about uh, swim and dive programs, golf programs. So does the range threshold, market area, uh, all of this ties back to central place theory. It's all about services being provided. In this case, the service we're talking about is athletics, major league or collegiate, but it's still a service being provided. And being able to predict that, that's what central place theory is all about. So we're going to see how this plays out tomorrow. Have a wonderful day, everyone. We'll see you next class.